As Limerick Director, I'm particularly proud to introduce our next Fireside Chat guest. After leaving high school just 10 years ago, John Collison and his brother Patrick moved to the US and created their first startup, Octomatic. They exited just two years later for $5 million when John was just 18 years old. While working on various projects, the guys identified a major pain point with online payments, and they created Stripe to tackle, Stripe to tackle this problem. Uh, with Stripe, they revolutionized online payments globally and crucially enabled hundreds of thousands of startups to sell online using their developer-friendly platform. And according to John, they're just getting started. John, uh, Stripe's most recent valuation was for $9 billion, and John is reportedly the world's youngest self-made billionaire. He's also a qualified pilot and pianist. Hosting this, this afternoon's Fireside Chat is Terold Baker, EMEA editor for the Wall Street Journal. But you'll also have your own opportunity to ask questions via Slido. The information is behind me. So would you all please raise your feet and give it up for John Collison. Awesome. Well, um, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everybody. John, uh, welcome. Uh, I just wanted to kick off. It's been a great introduction to uh, the great achievements you've, you've had already. But I wanted to kick off by giving you a chance to really explain what Stripe is. I was having breakfast this morning with the CEO of PayPal and one of the founders of Square and one of the executives from Western Union, all big payments companies. And one of the things that was very clear to me is that this is a highly complex industry and one where you may be competing with a company on one side, cooperating on another. Can you just tell us <coughs> what is Stripe's um, reason for existence? How has it succeeded? And a little bit how it fits into that ecosystem in terms of who it competes with, who it plays with, et cetera. Yeah, so this was actually something we ran into when we started Stripe and we were, when we were explaining it or recruiting for it or raising money for it, in that it was both the case that uh, the space felt really crowded. I mean, you have the PayPals and Squares and you know, every, everything of the world. And at the same time, uh, this specific problem was completely unaddressed. And so the specific problem Stripe solves is if you are starting an internet business tomorrow, uh, th before Stripe, there was no good way for you to accept money from your customers. And I mean, that sounds kind of strange on the face of it because we've had this internet thing for, for, for a long time. You'd think this problem would have been solved. But one, uh, the just accepting money from people globally was really hard. Uh, and so as you look at your potential customers all around the world, not just in the UK, not just in Europe, but you know, across all the continents, just reaching them was pretty difficult. And, and then maybe more relevantly, uh, accepting money is kind, of the, is kind of the easy part in a way. If you are running one of these new internet businesses, maybe it's a subscription company, or maybe you're running a digital marketplace or something like this, there are all these other tasks you have to attend to, you know, building billing infrastructure, preventing fraud, you know, st securely storing credit card data, handling compliance. And you're kind of left on your own, you know, if you're using PayPal or something like that, to, to deal with the rest of the stuff. And so we envisioned Stripe as an infrastructure platform for internet businesses to accept money from their customers. And does it, so would you be a, would Apple or Google or Amazon or MasterCard and Visa, for example, mm -hmm. be competitors of yours? Or are those people you work with and use their platforms to be your... So, so all those folks are actually fairly complementary. You know, one of the biggest changes we've seen in the payments world uh, over the past few years has been the emergence of things like Apple Pay and Android Pay. And that again, if you are, if you're a Stripe and you're looking to serve more online businesses and, and have them succeed, uh, the way we talk about it internally is increasing the GDP of the internet. That's yeah. our rubric for how can we actually help there be more business happening online. Uh, and if you want to do that, the biggest issue you run into is like actually buying things is archaic. Right, uh, in that the experience of pecking in your you know phone number uh, or your uh, credit card number on a mobile with your thumbs is 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 pretty painful. And the fact that you know, I mean, with the Wall Street Journal, it is much easier for me to buy a physical copy of the Wall Street Journal than it is for me to access it online behind this the paywall. True. And that's crazy when you think you know it's 2017. You think we would have figured this stuff out by now, um, but we haven't. And so one of the biggest things for our customers has been 
Uh, the fact that you go from everyone having to you know, type in a whole bunch of data entry to buy stuff to just being able to use Apple Pay or Android Pay, it's a significant and growing payment method for us. So it used to just be pure credit cards. Now we, you know, we were a launch partner for Apple Pay. You know, we work closely with Google on, on Android Pay. And we see stories like so Indiegogo, you know, the big crowdfunding site, they saw a doubling of conversions when they rolled out um, Apple Pay. And so we're excited about, one, the first order of effect that we think businesses will be more successful as you get modern, modernization like this. And two, I think there'll be a bunch of uh, new kinds of business that are possible as a result of this. And so, you know, the Wall Street Journal has not traditionally sold individual issues online because it's such a pain in the neck to actually buy things. You know, this is the kind of thing that could be possible now that you're starting to make things easier. Interesting. So we'll go back to the future in a second, but just take us back a little bit on your story of what happened. So you moved out to San Francisco, set this up. What was the sort of breakthrough moment you had when this really started to get traction and take off? What, what, what caused that? Yeah, so we started, you know, we started working on Stripe in 2009, and it was very much one of these stories. I think a lot of people happen upon entrepreneurial opportunities when you find something slightly broken in the world. And you know, I think there's two potential responses to finding something off or illogical about the world. Uh, one is you just kind of deal with it and move on. Uh, and the other is you stop and pause for a second. And you're like, is there a good reason that, that things are that way? And uh, I think you know, Stripe is very much not the only uh, example of this. You know, a lot of folks here probably use Slack. You know, I love Slack. And I remember pitching people on developing something like Slack in you know, 2011, 2012, because group chat was such a pain mm -hmm. in the neck. And Stripe is very much similar. Anyone who had dealt with accepting money online would happily talk your ear off about what a pain in the neck it had been. And yet, it, it felt like no one was talking about it. Yeah. So we started developing the first version of it. And the interesting thing, you know, when you say, was there a breakthrough moment, uh, so Stripe has always grown. You know, now you know, we've had customers for six and a half years on Stripe. There was never you know, the South by Southwest moment when you know, the, the chart just uh, like went vertical. It has been six and a half years of very steady exponential growth, uh, or seven, yeah. And, uh, and that is kind of how it's emerged. Because you know, these things, they take a while to, to actually ramp up. And how embedded are people? Once they join you, do they leave? Or are people pretty locked in once they've taken your? People, by and large, stay with Stripe. And you know, not, not because they can't move elsewhere. They obviously can. But uh, for two reasons. I mean, one, we, we internally, the, the teams at Stripe put a huge amount of effort into making sure the product works well, you know, regardless of if you are a you know, small startup starting out, or now we have you know, the UK government uses Stripe for the, you know, the Scottish land registry, if any of you are Scottish landlords, uh, or you know, the ASOSs or Facebooks and Salesforces of the world. So at, at the high end, it also very much works. And the other part, again, is if you were to not use Stripe, you'd probably have to devote internal engineering teams to replicating the functionality offered by Stripe. And for, all, you know, for nearly all tech companies these days, they realize that they are constrained largely on engineering resources. You know, that is the bottleneck. And so do you want your engineers working on the product, or do you want them working on internal engineering infrastructure? It's generally not a debate. Interesting. And, and you know, we're sitting here in London. Um, you decided to do this in San Francisco. Uh, given your experience, could you have achieved this in London, or was being in Silicon Valley or San Francisco an important part of this success? You know, there's probably two forms of that question. Could we have built it in London then and built it in London now? Okay, well, let's um, answer both of those. Yeah, so... Let's start with could you have done it then, and then how much has changed? I, I think then it would have been quite challenging. Uh -huh. uh, and here's why. In, in, in my experience, when people talk about startup ecosystems uh, and, uh, and kind of fostering entrepreneurship, there tends to be a slightly misplaced focus on capital uh, and you know, talking about the number of investors and the amounts raised and stuff like that. And I think it's misplaced for two reasons. One, because it's increasingly cheaper to start internet businesses, and, and so the availability of capital becomes less relevant as you do that. And honestly, I think all the focus ends up on capital because it's easy to measure. You know, it's just there, and you can you know, add numbers you can together. See evaluation. You can, you can quantify it, exactly. For us, you know, the big thing that ended up being massively influential as we built out Stripe was you know, Stripe was 
two people seven years ago, uh, and you know, we were doing everything from writing code to talking to customers to setting what the product should be. Stripe is now 750 people. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley has an enormous pool of people who are both highly skilled and highly experienced. You know, the guy who runs engineering at Stripe has been in the industry for 30 years. He worked on SSL at Netscape when SSL was being developed. You know, you, you get all this accumulated experience that you can bring to bear on the, on, on the problem. And the fact that people aren't too conservative. They're actually pretty risk tolerant. You know, I, I remember when we were hiring our, you know, our first COO as, as our eighth employee and, uh, you know, the, the, it was this, you know, company, you know, it wasn't clear what the future would be. You know, he had a very established track record and, and he was totally willing to take the jump and it might have worked out, it might have not. And that is the thing that I think that other places are starting to catch up on. You know, now there's obviously a very, you know, between DeepMind and Google and Facebook and all the, you know, significant engineering presences in London, uh, places are starting to catch up on the depth of the talent pool, and they're starting to catch up on the risk tolerance, but no one is at Silicon Valley levels yet. <clears throat> so the answer to the question is it would have been difficult then, but is more possible now, you think? That's right. Okay. Uh, and, and I think you see this in the data now where the number of significant tech companies that are being created is kind of up and to the right. And how much difference does it make here in the UK not having a massive US market as your domestic market? Is that a big problem, or is that something that companies here can actually uh, overcome pretty easily now? Well, this is getting um, dangerously close to the, to the question of the month uh, on, on, on Brexit, but... Uh, you can answer that at the same time. Well, well, well <laughs> but you know, tr tr traditionally, I mean, what I notice with a lot of uh, European companies is, is that they start out serving the European market, uh, and they don't necessarily limit themselves to the, to the domestic uh, market. But you know, the, uh, do you know where the biggest concentration of uh, startups is by number of entrepreneurs or capital? I'm going to be asking the questions, but... Um, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, <coughs> no, the answer is I have no idea. It, Tell me. It, it, it's Israel. Uh, and, you know, okay. Israel obviously is a very small domestic market, but, you know, they have, they're a huge exporter of technology and they make very successful global companies. I mean, if you, if you took directions driving here, you know, it's probably powered by Waze, which is mm -hmm. an Israeli company, sure. now integrated into Google Maps, but still based in, 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 in Israel. Um, and so uh, I, I think the size of the domestic market is not necessarily a, a limitation. Okay, and you raised Brexit. Is that going to have a big impact, do you think, from where you sit? Um, long term, long term, I think all the trends that Stripe is a part of and Stripe is betting on, you know, globalization, uh, you know, more commerce moving onto the internet, more openness, those trends will continue long term. Uh, and, and we're not worried about that, despite, you know, maybe some short term retren re retrenchment uh, and inward lookingness in, in the UK, in the US as well, obviously. Uh, but in the short term, as we looked at, you know, we have an office in London, as we think about hiring in the UK, I mean, you, you spend a year complaining about immigrants and unsurprisingly, people are, people both want to move to the UK less and it's less obvious, you know, how we will be able to hire and, and kind of make London a, a talent hub. So, that definitely is a, a real factor for us when it comes to hiring. We'll, we'll, go, to, we'll go into um, a little bit more on the future of payments in a second, but just one question I'm interested in. Um, what's it like setting up a company with your brother? How does that work? Mm. Are you guys um, still friends? Does it work out well? I mean, how does that incredible proximity um, play out over this sort of intensity and this sort of period? Yeah, you know, the, uh, my standard go-to joke is that, uh, you know, we, we, we got all the fights out of the way when we were, you know, when we were three and five, so, you know, we've got, um, it's kind of smooth sailing from, from there. But, I mean, th th there is actually a little bit of, of truth in that, in that, as anyone here who's done it knows, uh, starting a startup is really hard and stressful and very all-consuming. And so, if you are simultaneously trying to learn how to work effectively with someone while doing a startup, th that's a tall order. And you can yeah. do it, and lots of people have done it, to be clear. Um, but it's just a lot at once. And so having someone where, you know, Patrick and I not only, you know, we're, we're brothers, but had started a business before and everything, having someone who, who you can work well with, um, that's, pretty, that's pretty valuable. Okay. Um, going forward, 
What are the biggest things? I mean, you've obviously carved out this position so far. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest things that still need to be solved in this industry? Is it fraud? Is it speed of transaction? Is it people's identities, the cost of transactions? What, are the, what, what is the big thing that you're focused on? Uh, I would say there are two major things that we're very focused on. One is uh, our international coverage is still a journey, and it is still mind-boggling to me that you, know, you have whatever number you ascribe to it, maybe three, four billion people connected to the internet as, uh, as users there, and yet the economic grid is lagging very far behind, and so you know, we launched a, a partnership with Alipay a while back to let people reach Chinese consumers. You know, we, we have other payment methods in, in, in the works, but just we're not there, yeah. uh, and that is something that we invest a lot of time in because uh, it should be the case that as you set up an internet business, you, you can address this global audience, and that is not yet the case. The second thing is we are... But just on that, are you seeing signs of um, a simplification of payments beginning to make it much more possible to open companies in less obvious places? Are you beginning to see real signs of people yeah, well, doing that? We, we both see people starting companies in far-flung places, and we... Um, uh, see smaller companies going global quicker. So we have this company Chuffed, which is uh, an Australian platform for, for nonprofits, and uh, you know they were going international and opening in all these countries when they were two people, which is just something that would not have been possible yeah. ten years ago. So that's one. There's a second point. The second thing is there's this growing trend of the platform economy and people building marketplace businesses on Stripe. So I feel like in, you know Internet 1.0 was you build a full stack business yourself and you own every part of it. You know this is the Pets.com mm -hmm. and you know you have your warehouses full of pet food and everything like that. Uh, as you look at the successful companies that are growing now. It is often, you know, someone like Deliveroo co co collecting, or sorry, connecting supply and demand in a whole bunch of markets where they operate. And we are very long this trend, and we see a huge number of, of companies doing it. And it's everyone from obviously new startups starting out, and you know, it's, it's the big companies like the Deliveroo's and Lyft and Grab Taxi and Uber that tend to get the headlines. Um, but you know, there are many companies doing a marketplace for construction equipment rental on Stripe. And you kind of don't tend to think about that, but it's like a really significant need that the internet can make much better. There's much more liquidity, there's mm -hmm. much more better trust and safety, reputation, things like that. Um, and so, you know, it, often the ones getting the headlines are at the head, but there's a, you know, there's a long number of them. And we even see large corporates uh, getting into this as a way for them to not get disrupted by all the startups that come nibbling along. Because I think, you know, the companies, you know, the startups that are here tend to look at the large companies and say, ah, you know, maybe we'll be like them someday. The funny thing is, you know, when we go talk to large companies, they're looking at all the small startups and they see, you know, they're not, you know, hotels see Airbnb coming along and they're like, wow, you know, we need to, we need to figure out what our strategy is here. And so you folks like um, uh, uh, Daimler building a ride-sharing service on Stripe. We thought yep. that was really cool. You have uh, ASOS building ASOS Marketplace, uh, which is their answer to uh, kind of the, the, the faster-moving fashion trends and letting things get set up and running quicker. And so you, you have marketplaces bo both being set up at the, at the startup level, but also at the, uh, at, at the larger corporate level. And when you look out, let's say, 10 years from this point, how simple can payments actually get? I mean, you still charge a couple of percent mm -hmm. for each transaction, something like that? In the UK, it's 1.4%. 1.4, sorry, so a bit less than that. <clears throat> but still a decent amount of money for mm -hmm. each transaction coming through. I mean, at what point are we going to have a much more simple system where you don't have banks doing this and credit cards doing this and people taking a cut of each part of this framework? Well, I think any time... I mean, fundamentally, if it costs money to move money, there'll be some yeah. charge to do it. Sure. That should be kind of commensurate with the, the value delivered. Where we would like to see things go is, you know, uh, uh, that guy I mentioned, Billy, who we hired early on as our, as our COO, uh, you know, he, he had worked in many startups, um, you know, before Stripe, and he, he had described the, the horror stories of, you know, back in the day, you know, if you're launching a service and you're going to have a big splashy news launch, you're there six months in advance ordering servers and, yeah. you know, racking them and figuring out capacity planning, what are we actually going to need, things like this. And uh, the cloud really did change that, where Stripe runs on Amazon Web Services, and there is this whole function that we don't, we don't need to contemplate as a result of that being provided as infrastructure on tap. 
We're not there yet, but we see that as very much where the business world should go, where I shouldn't need to think that much about the you know, tax or you know, currency or whatever implications of running this global business. So we want to more and more automate a bunch of the back office uh, and give people time back. And there is still plenty, you know, we, we have a to-do list as long as your arm in terms of things we need to do to, to, to get there. But ideally, businesses could just focus on the differential value they're providing on what they are good at, and, and, and we can kind of handle the rest. Uh, we're going to go to questions in a minute. So if you haven't asked your question on Slido, please do. I'll go to them in a second. And if you could put them on the screen, somebody, that would be fantastic as well. Um, <clears throat> where do, how does... Um, blockchain or some of the currencies, the cryptocurrencies, play into this? I mean, are they going to be this very seamless way of transferring money that becomes mainstream in the future, or are there going to be too many barriers to that happening? How do you see them fitting into the whole? Yeah, so I don't know. It feels like every time you know, the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum is going you know, up and to the right right now, and you know, the, the amount of uh, attention paid to them tends to follow the price yeah. curve. Uh, Which is an amazing price curve. It, 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 it's a crazy price curve, yeah. No, it really is um, kind of fascinating to watch. You know, I don't own any bitcoins or anything, and so I'm just an. Uh, you haven't you know, been tempted to. Um... Uh, no, I'm, I'm an idle observer, um, but uh, it seems like a, a slightly dangerous speculation game. But uh, we. By think... the way, this is someone who knows their stuff on payments, so you should listen to that. <laughs> um, we think the. I mean, the technologies behind distributed consensus protocols and distributed ledgers are very interesting and probably will be a more significant part of the financial world going future than they have been historically because getting this stuff right, I mean, traditionally you did it very cumbersome, you know, clearing transactions in the US is super slow, partly as a result of this, you know, mm -hmm. you send someone a bank transfer, it takes three days to arrive. It's, uh, it's kind of shocking. And so I think we will see more of that. Whether it'll be specifically Bitcoin or specifically the Bitcoin blockchain, because you know the, sure. the cryptocurrency nerds here, you can get into like the technical details of the protocol, and you know they run into scaling issues and stuff like that. I'm somewhat skeptical of that, and I'm somewhat skeptical of Bitcoin as a raw payment method, if for no other reason than you have all the forex stuff of you know if you want to pay twenty dollars, the amount you have to pay in Bitcoin kind of keeps changing. But um, distributed ledgers, sure, absolutely. And just, I'm going to go to questions, but just finally, quickly, on fraud, obviously mm -hmm. a big issue with payments all the time. Um, is that something that, in your experience, is getting worse, getting better? What's the trajectory of that? It, it's gradually getting better. I mean, we started from a place where it really was the Wild West. I mean, credit card security is ridiculous when you think about it, in that you have a, uh, you know, you're, you're giving your credit card number, and the way it's historically worked is, uh, you know, now your credit card number is sitting with all these uh, businesses that... Um, that, that are not in the cybersecurity business and shouldn't have to be in the cybersecurity business. So one, that's kind of one of the things that we end up selling on is the fact that Stripe handles all the credit card data. We're good at securely storing it so you don't have to. And it's the general way of the world. I mean, Apple Pay and Android Pay, people tend to talk about the, you know, the stuff that's very visible, like, oh, you can pay with your thumbprint and stuff like that. But the fact that the business never, ha never has to or never can see your financial data that's a big deal, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a huge step forward on the, on the security angle. So I think it's getting better. Um, it, it, it needs to get better still, okay. but we'll get there. Let's go to a few questions. So um, what was the toughest moment of your journey? Were there any big decisions that you felt like you have no idea what's going to happen? So this is obviously someone who's in the throes of mm -hmm. making those decisions. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, one, one thing that was interesting is it wasn't... Stripe kind of took forever to work uh, in that, you know, we're here seven and a half years in, and, and in the early stages, I mean, yeah, you have these signs of life and it's growing, but, you know, zoomed out, certainly in the chart now, you have these yeah. kind of tiny trickles of stuff coming in. And so part of what's hard is just for some kinds of infrastructural problems like this, it takes an incredibly long time for the investments to actually pay off. You know, people often ask us about kind of raising money and our strategies and things like that. I mean, we kind of had no choice in that when you're working on something like Stripe, the, you, you do all this work in the early stages that pays off, you know, 5, 10, 15 years in the future. That was one of the harder things. I mean, obviously nothing catastrophic happened or we wouldn't be sitting here talking. Was there any particular learning, the question's gone, but was there any particular learning moment that you had or not, not really? Was, I mean, it sounds like it all went, you said, that there was no big inflection point. I'm just, smoothing so, out the curve a little bit. It was a, yeah. you know, so it was a little Was there any moment the to this question? Was there any tough moment where you really had to dig in and make a tough call or learn something that was particularly profound that you can share? 
I would say the hardest things tend to be, and anyone who's had to deal with them in the audience can probably relate, the hardest things are probably people related. Yep. So, you know, Stripe is not, all the kind of press tends to focus on the founders, but Stripe is a group of 750 people making the, you know, rowing in unison, making the whole thing work. And so finding the right people, it taking forever to find the right person, finding the right person and them not wanting to join, uh, good people leaving, you know, stuff like that, that tends to hit you pretty hard because it's, it's personal. Okay, so what, there's another question that's related to that around culture. Um, how did the culture team change as you scaled Stripe and any lessons learned that you wish someone had told you in advance? Um, so, there is this fascination in startup culture, which I object to around preserving the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I object to it because the implicit hubris in the, and I know this wasn't what the question was asking, but, it, but it's kind of my bugbear, the, the implicit hubris in assuming that you had the right culture in the beginning. We have very much tried to optimize for, you know, there are certain uh, things that we value at Stripe, uh, I, 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 but how those manifest will change over time. And I can point to several points during which during Stripe's history, during which the culture meaningfully improved because there was, you know, a discipline that we weren't good at, that we, um, that, that, that we started to become good at. You know, there were things that we started emphasizing. In the early days, for example, you're just flying by night, you're making decisions based on gut because you don't have the metrics in place uh, and you kind of can't do things in a metrics-oriented way because you don't have any mm. customers to have data on. You know, we have shifted over time to become a much more metrics-oriented um, company and that has that has been to our benefit how, do, how would you describe your culture so and I know you, I mean I know you're saying it should constantly change and morph but, but no the, the, what is the essence of right it? it's a good it's a good question what the invariants of the culture are um, one people are generally um, hard-working care about their specific craft very well uh, we care a lot about people being rigorous uh, in their thinking and execution in that there is no blueprint for Stripe. We're kind of half a technology company, half a finance company, but we're building a developer-focused infrastructure platform. There's just often, you know, there aren't other companies we can crib answers from, and so you end up inventing a lot of stuff from first principles, and we want people who are not just seeing what everyone else does and kind of blindly copying it. Uh, a lot of our best products have come from rethinking, it's like, whoa, stop. I mean, some people here will be familiar with Stripe Atlas, which is nothing to do with payments. It's an incorporation service, but actually, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense for Stripe, but it was not at all obvious to begin with. And then, honestly, uh, people are nice uh, in that, you know, well, no, seriously, Silicon Valley has a, uh, you know, uh, often talks about having a no assholes rule at companies, and that's a really low bar. I mean, if, if that's what you're selecting for, it's like, come on. Uh, and so we, we just, we're in this for the long term. You, you know, you, you want people to be jumping out of bed in the morning, not just because the work is interesting and the mission is meaningful, even though it hopefully is, but also because they genuinely like all the people they're working alongside and they're good co-contributors. And so kind of to get back to the, any specific advice or culture on, uh, on whoever asked that question, one is just the meta advice of always be seeking to up-level the culture rather than preserve, you know, people get hung up on you know, we have this tradition, or, you know, we, you know, like very surface stuff, as opposed to saying, okay, how do we execute as a team and kind of up-leveling that over time? And then the second thing for us, at least, that's worked quite well is uh, caring about having good people as people uh, uh, rather than just their skill set. Brilliant. We're out of time. Thank you very much indeed. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.